All right, guys, welcome back. This is going to be part two of episode three of Cloud Security Engineering. And I know I promised this about two weeks ago, but better late than never. And uh, today we're going to be showing you guys some of the resources that you're going to be using within AWS, uh, whether you're a security analyst, whether you're on SecOps, or whether you're an engineer, whether you're on Sec Engineering. So, hope you guys enjoy. <laughs> Guys, whether you go into Sec Engineering or Sec Ops, get a Yeti, right? People take you way more seriously when um, you show up to the job with a Yeti or, or you drink black coffee. It's one of the two. I don't know which one it is, but do both and, and hopefully you'll get that job that you want, okay? There's my pro tip. I'll see you guys later. All right, so if you're using the cloud as a security engineer or whether you're um, a security operations specialist, you're going to be having to look at a console like this, right? And I know this has been shown in my past couple videos when we're going through the actual resources, but I kind of want to put like a, a divider between, hey, if you're on SecOps, you'll be looking at this kind of stuff. If you're on Sec Engineering, you'll be looking at this kind of stuff, right? I think it's really, really useful to know the kind of resources you're going to be looking at as a security operations specialist or a security engineer, because when you're doing that interview, you're going to be able to kind of base the questions off or base your answers off of what we're talking about here for the questions that the interviewer might have. So although I could talk about a, a ton of different things right now, um, I think we should just kind of focus on, on a couple main ones for each role, and it'll help get you guys started along the path of hey, Sec Engineering does a lot of technical work with these resources, let's elaborate on that. And SecOps does a lot of analytics and eyes on glass work with these resources, let's elaborate on that. We're gonna start with SecOps here. <clears throat> if you're in security operations, you're gonna be doing the day-to-day -day process work of the entire organization. So you're gonna come in, you're most likely gonna be using a SIM tool, and I have a SIM tool up right here that I'm gonna be showing you guys, it's called Alert Logic. You're gonna be looking at threats like this. I can't go in deeper on this because it's my own personal, um, it's my own personal dashboard, but when you come in in the morning, you're gonna be looking at threats, okay? You're gonna be looking at threats across multiple platforms. Say you have on-premise stuff that's still uh, being used, or legacy as it would be called. Uh, you can look at threats like that or through alert logic uh, for that. <clears throat> or you could look at threats within the AWS console. But for right now, we're gonna be talking about threats and alert logic. The job of security engineer in this process, in this alert logic process, would be to set up the CloudTrail logs that come from AWS, right? So CloudTrail logs are literally just your logging resource in AWS. So a security engineer would set up your CloudTrail logs so that you, the SecOps specialist or the security analyst, could come in and view those threats from your multiple accounts and classify those threats and quantify them and put them into a vulnerability backlog that can then be presented to other teams or management based on your criticality scores and, and things like that. So you're going to be looking at a lot of... Uh, it's going to be a lot of eyes on glass work where you're coming in every day, you're looking at things such as vulnerabilities, you're researching those vulnerabilities and how they could affect our assets or your company's assets. And this is an example of an outside security tool, but there's also stuff that you can do inside AWS. And one thing I'm going to show you guys now is something called Security Hub. And it's going to be based on these foundations, right? So the CIS AWS foundation controls are going to be the rules that are managed by Security Hub. So if we come into Security Hub, and I know that this isn't gonna be that, it's not gonna be new news to, to some of you guys, but I think we should still go through it. So if I go to Enable Security Hub, and I can pick a, a couple different rule sets, and let me zoom in here. So we have Foundational Best Practices, we have Foundations Benchmark, which is gonna be our compliance checks. Um, foundational Best Practices is gonna be something we'll talk about in another video, but it's going to be, um, more technical and binary best practices that you're going to be looking into or you could do pci i've never personally done pci i have never been in an organization that ingests credit card data so i don't know anything about that we're going to enable um, cis aws foundations and we'll enable security up here so if you're an analyst and i enable these standards you're going to come in every single day and you're going to see after this configures you're going to see a score right? And a really good score is going to be in that 60 to 100% mark. I have never been in a company where their compliance standards have 100% accuracy. But the company I work at now, we have a compliance standard of 
I don't know, anywhere from 74 to about 80. So your daily job is going to be coming in and seeing which accounts are violating these standards. Say they have to rotate their credentials. They have an unused password of over 90 days. It's all based on what the security engineer and your security team in general kind of sets the rule set as. But you're going to be coming in and looking at these, um, these rules. And if anything's kind of in violation of that, you're going to be reaching out to those people, those uh, those employees or your coworkers, and seeing how you can fix those rules, whether it's, again, rotating an access key, getting a host off a quad zero security group. This is going to be your main job. You're going to be eyes on glass. You're going to be looking at everything that is failing on this screen here, and you're going to be trying to remediate it. Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you guys, this takes about 30 minutes to enable because um, it's basically going through your entire infrastructure and aligning all of your rule sets with your users and your resources. So I'm going to grab some espresso, and when this is enabled, I will be right back. Ignore this warning up here, right? But after this is enabled, every single day you're going to be able to come in and check your security score right here. Basically, you'll come in, uh, like I said, a company like mine will have a security score of, I mean, you'll, you'll make kind of markers of what you want your security score to be, and it doesn't have to be 100%. Um, this is more like just compliance, like everything else. Uh, you don't have to hit 100% on it, but it's something that you have to be aspiring to hit because you can get sued for certain things and whatnot. The only thing that'll hold you against something like this, something like AWS CIS or NIST CSF or anything like that is your security policies. They'll align you against certain frameworks and then you basically have to base your entire security program around that framework. So as an analyst, you'll come in here and you will see this. And obviously right now we only have one account, so it's only gonna be one failed um, and 3% on this account don't put too much thought into that. It's just a test account. So, um, but you'll see all these and you'll see why they're failing, right? So if an, a user doesn't have MFA enabled, it'll say the account name. Uh, this is just a warning right here. But as an analyst, you'll come in every day and you'll see, you'll see failed things. You'll see um, past and your job will be to go into the failed ones. And this is just specific to my organization, but I think it's specific to a lot of organizations that follow AWS CIS, but you'll come in and you'll have to see accounts that are failing certain things. Like a, a huge one is people not rotating their access keys. So if you see this, you'll have to message that user. Obviously there'll be a user under here. You'll message the user, they'll rotate their access keys, and then you'll regain that compliance that you didn't have. Now this is kind of like a microcosm of what you'll have to do as an analyst, but I think these two examples, Alert Logic and AWS Security Hub, show some really good all around examples of what you'll have to do as a security analyst in the cloud. Now as a security engineer in the cloud, and again, this is based on what your company wants to do. It's not cloud wide or organization wide that uses the cloud. So if you have your security hub set up, and this coincides really, really well with what analysts do, but as an engineer, you're gonna have to be setting up the actual connectivity and the configurations in the back end of for what the analyst is gonna be doing. So in order for this to read all of your accounts, you're gonna to have to set up what's called CloudTrail logs. And that's just basically AWS's version of global logging. So you're gonna to have to set up CloudTrail logs that log all these accounts and they log to like a central um, S3 bucket or something like that. But just to speak conceptually, you'll be the person behind the scenes connecting all of these accounts, right? So you'll be writing code to connect all of these rule sets to all of your other accounts, because this is really easy to do when you have one account. Speaking of Security Hub, when you have multiple accounts, you're gonna have to connect all those accounts using something called AWS organizations, and you're gonna have to set up VPC peering, all these kinds of things. And I promise we'll get to those things. And I know you guys are gonna laugh at me because I haven't made one of these videos in a week, but I promise we'll get to those things and I'll, I'll kind of explain all that to you. So you're gonna be using something called, and again, this can be specific to the organization you're in. But something that a lot of companies are gonna begin using is a code pipeline. And basically what this does is if you have multiple accounts, right, it's gonna create a centralized pipeline or a seed pipeline that holds all of your rule sets automated. Then you can take those rule sets and you can push them organization wide. So say you have a change in one of your accounts and you bring on a new account, right? And when I say account, I mean actual account. Like this is an account in itself, right? You would have another account that you would connect to this main account. So say you have a change in one of your accounts, you want to add a new account. 
and you want to push the security pipeline or the security uh, hub dashboard into that account, but you don't want to manually go in and do it because that can be kind of tedious, you would have that already automated in the back end. And all you would do is run your code pipeline from here. Right? And I know this one said failed. It would pull the source code, it would build it, and then it would push it to that account. And in the code, you'd have to specify the actual account number or the account ID. I'm not going to show you mine. But that's something that a, a security engineer in the cloud would do. In terms of the code pipeline, that's going to be like the main goal of this series is to be able to get you guys to build out rule sets, automate those rule sets, and build a code pipeline. And I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. Obviously, it's going to take time. There's going to be multiple episodes, but we're definitely going to get there sooner or later. So stick with it. Um, I guarantee all this will start to make sense. If it doesn't, again, leave some comments below, and I'll be happy to explain it to you in the Discord or privately or whatever avenue you want to go down. As a security engineer, and there's many things that you may have to do here, but, and again, organi organization specific. So don't hold me to these exact, th exact things. Um, I understand that some organizations might not do this, some might. A really common thing that a security engineer will do, and I've done this in my past three companies, is set up a web application firewall or a WAF. And this is gonna be its own specific video in itself, but I just wanna kind of set you up for things that you might have to do while you're working as a security engineer. So basically you'd have to set up things like the WAF, things like a code pipeline, um, you'd have to do VPC connectivity, you'd have to set up security groups, you'd have to automate all this stuff. Now some companies might not make you automate things, they might want things manually done because automation can take time and it might not present the best business value. Remember how in the first episode we talked about business value and how you can create really cool things but if it doesn't bring business value to the organization, they're not gonna let you do it. So things, that a security engineer will do would be automating all those things or, or even manually configuring those things. Not all security engineers have to know code. You, I would almost 100% guarantee that you're gonna use code as a security engineer, but some companies might make you not use code. You might not have to use code. And the last thing that we're gonna talk about in a, in a broad scope, and again, we're gonna delve into these things in great, great detail in this series, but one thing that you might have to make as a security engineer is a Lambda function. Now these lambdas are gonna interact with all the things that we just talked about there. And I'm gonna run you through a quick one here. So don't, don't really worry about what I'm doing, but just worry about the conceptual idea of, of what I'm trying to put forward. So <clears throat> lambda functions are basically event triggers that are coded. If you trigger your code pipeline, it's gonna trigger an internal lambda function that's gonna then push your code. And again, ask me questions if you guys don't know what I'm talking about. I, I think you guys won't. But again, it's not important um, as of right now. So as a security engineer, you're going to have to know and have to be able to at least understand the connectivity between, say, things like the firewall, um, the code pipeline, the Lambda, and how those things all connect with basic resources like EC2, um, S3, VPCs, subnets, and things like that. Now, I think this is a really good overview of what you need to know in terms of the two specializations in the career, ready SecOps and Sec Engineering. And in this series, we're gonna dive deeper and deeper and deeper, mainly into the Sec Engineering stuff, but you'll see a lot of SecOps and Sec Analyst things pop up in, I mean, in the interim, because that's basically the function of Sec Engineering. It's to support the analyst and process work of SecOps. So I know it was a long time coming, um, waited about a week to make this video. Apologize for that. Uh, I've been working on a couple of courses. I'm working on my Udemy course as well as the Skillshare course. So be on the lookout for those in the future. And I hope this uh, short video added some context into the kind of career path you want to take and when you take that career path, what you'll be responsible for. And the, the main goal of this video wasn't to explain everything in depth. It was just to make it so you know what resources you're going to have to talk about when you're going for an interview. And again, you might not have to know right off the bat all, what all these resources are, but if you're able to talk about them, it gives you a much higher chance of getting the job that you want or getting that first little um, entrance into the career you want. So I hope this helped. Um, if you guys have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Leave a like, subscribe. Appreciate you guys for watching, and I will see you next time.